any day that the choir performs is a special Sunday, but I wanted to uh, particularly welcome Linda Pronger, our new choir director, in her debut performance. And thank you. Last week, uh, in our debut sermon for the official start of the church here, we talked about visions of wholeness and connectedness. We talked about the scientific vision, which says that all of us are seamlessly part of one physical universe, unfolding in space and time. We talked about mystical visions of a living universe in which all being is pouring into us as we are pouring into all other things. And we talked about how the idea of interdependence expressed through our seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of life of which we are a part, how interdependence is of central importance to the religious vision of modern Unitarian Universalism. And so today, as a sort of companion sermon, I want to step back from this vision of unity, from the oneness of everything, and look at the other side of the coin. Not the whole, but the part, the individual. Because as much as this idea of wholeness and connectedness and community and all these kind of hand-holding kumbaya words, as much as they are important to us and they resonate with us, there's this other part of our tradition, very strong on the Unitarian side, but also on the Universalism side, that says that we are a religion that upholds the sanctity of the individual. A tradition that says UU churches are places where the individual and individuality is protected, nurtured, cultivated, and celebrated. And I wouldn't have it any other way, and I don't think any of you would either. It wouldn't be possible for me to be a part of this church if I didn't believe that this was a place where as a matter of principle, of bedrock principle, we supported and celebrated the sanctity of the individual body, the independence of the individual mind, the freedom of the individual conscience, and protect, often means protecting from other people, right? We protect autonomy, we protect separateness, we protect your right to step back from the larger group, and their claims, and say this is a place where, against the dictates of conformity or orthodoxy, we want you to be your authentic self, to be who you truly are, and we will stand by you. And then there's an asterisk, and there's some fine print about bad behavior. <laughs> Four of our seven principles are about affirming and protecting the individual in their spiritual journey. The freedom, the right to be our authentic self is one of the hallmarks of our Unitarian Universalist tradition. So we have our deep principle of interdependence, but we also have principles of independence. And we hope that we have a religion where these ideals can play nicely with each other, but sometimes there's a tension there. And I'm going to suggest that some of this, as to how well these ideals will play together, is going to depend on what we mean by ourself, when we talk about our right to be our authentic self. Setting aside our legally recognized identity, right, what it says on your driver's license, what do we mean when we talk about ourself? How do we understand our individual self, our personhood? When we talk about I or me versus you or we, who is that me? What is that me? And what is me and what is not me? Now that's not just an empty philosophical question. Just on a physical level, on the level of our bodies, sorting that question out is immediately the first order of business. If you hope to have a me for any length of time at all as an organism, you better do a bang up job of identifying what is me and what is not me, and keeping the me in and keeping the not me out, or you are not going to be around for very long on this planet Earth. And this isn't an easy task, right? The law of entropy is working against you. The law of entropy says the natural inclination of the universe is to move from disorder, excuse me, from order to disorder. The natural movement is for disorder to increase. 
And I know that's true because I've seen my kitchen. <laughs> everything wants to mix with everything else. All of these forces want our sort of complex bodies to fall apart. So it's work to keep our insides inside. We exist as individuals precisely because we're pushing back against this natural tendency of all matter and energy to sort of rejoin the oneness of everything. Then there are all these other parts of our environment that are actively trying to get all in our business all the time. Bacteria, viruses, spores, little tiny animals. It's amazing how many different kinds of things are working to enter our bodies all the time. If you ever want to be really horrified and fascinated, but also horrified, I recommend a book called Parasite Rex by the scientist Carl Zimmer, which is all about the role that parasitism plays in the order of life. Don't read it right before dinner. <laughs> and he says that it's a parasite's world and we're just living in it. <laughs> and much of our work as biological selves is spent identifying what does not belong inside of us, what is not me and keeping it out, right? So we got skin and hair and grooming mechanisms and our immune system, right? Identifying not me and blasting it, rooting out in things. Totally, uh, sometimes serendipitous things happen right before a sermon. I'd already written this and was going to talk about this and Suzanne says, oh, there's a video on YouTube of a parasite worm leaving a dead train man. Do you want to see it? Yeah, I want to see it. <laughs> so she dials it up, and I'm watching it, and, and the, the praying man just dies, and this worm leaves, and it just keeps going and going and going and going. Like, that is so horrifyingly visceral. <laughs> well, you asked to see it. I did. I did ask to see it. So we want to keep the not me out. But if we think of ourselves as being this sort of single biological entity, jealously guarding these well-defined boundaries, there's an interesting wrinkle to this picture, because we now know that our bodies are also host to complex colonies of bacteria, of other living things, and that there's an entire ecosystem of living things that lives inside of us and on us, and without it, we could not function. We are entirely independent, uh, dependent upon it. Our GI tract, in particular, houses up to a thousand distinct species of bacteria, all forming a little bacterial society together. And it's called a biome. And we're just starting to understand the impact of these biomes on our health and our well-being. There's a suggestion that people have different biomes, like people have different blood types. There are particular biomes that different people have. Changes in the biome have been implicated in everything from obesity to periodontal disease, functioning of our immune system, brain development, even our emotional health. They took, uh, researchers took anxious mice and brave mice, and they swapped their biome cultures. And they found that when they did that, the anxious mice became brave, and the brave mice became anxious. So this is really cutting edge stuff. And it's coming from a deepening understanding that our physical selves are more than just our human body with our individual DNA. We're a complicated interrelated colony of different living creatures. There are 10 times more non-human cells in our body than there are human cells, with 100 times more genetic diversity than in our own DNA. In fact, there was a recent survey of the literature in the National Institute of Health referred to us as the human superorganism, a conglomerate of mammalian and microbial cells. Right? That's how you can think of yourself now. I'm a conglomerate of mammalian and microbial cells. Now, what is me and what is not me? It's not so simple. Now, when we think about our mind, our awareness, our ego, we probably have an idea that this is me, this is my real self. We identify ourselves as a kind of non-physical something that's inside our body, the things that moves the body around with its commands. I think most people probably think along the lines of we have a body, not we are our body. We have a body, and we're whoever is driving the car. 
were the ghost in the machine, to borrow philosopher Gilbert Ryle's memorable phrase. And because that idea of ourself as a solitary ghost inside a machine is so embedded in our culture, it's such a deep idea, it goes back to the ancient Egyptians, through the ancient Greeks, adopted by the Christians. By default, we do think of our mental self as a sort of a single unified me. There's a me in here that thinks, that feels, that makes decisions, that accepts moral responsibility. And we think of that as our self. Uh, Descartes enshrined that idea in modern philosophy with his famous, I think, therefore I am. The thinking me comes first, the body is optional. Now because that's such a default idea, I want to offer two alternative pictures, just as different ways of thinking. And these are just sketches, but we're going to throw out some themes today that we'll come back to later on in the year. So the first alternative that I want to suggest to this image of the ghost in the machine is that there's not one ghost inside of you, but there are thousands of ghosts inside of you. Millions of ghosts inside of you. Analogizing your physical body, which turned out to be a complex colony of creatures, our spiritual body, our ego, our self, whatever word you want to use, could be thought of as a complex colony of ghosts. The words and ideas and cultural practices of millions of people who lived before you who supplied the cultural material that shaped the development of your inner world. Reflect on how little of our inner life, our thoughts and ideas and prejudices and value judgments, could be said to be truly, originally, our own. I would imagine the most fantastically independent and original thinker who ever lived did not truly originate one part in a million of the contents of her inner world. That's not a criticism, right? There's nothing to suggest that humans could or should uh, create our minds from the ground up. That's not how it works. Even by learning language, though, we learn someone else's idea of how to break up and categorize the world. We learn what's worth talking about and what's not worth talking about. We acquire a myriad of preferences and prejudices and implicit color commentary about life and they impact us. Imagine a world, an American culture, in which the words slut or thug or their equivalent simply did not exist because no one had ever said them. It's a different world in which those words don't exist to shape our mental picture. And then there are all the other ideas and norms and cultural practices that are poured into us as we develop. Through stories, truisms, slogans, pop songs, pictures, Sunday school, TV show, Bazooka Joe bubblegum rappers. <laughs> right, we're living hosts for the spirits of all the people who live before us. And they live on through us. And in the same way for the spirits of each other, all those people with whom we are co-creating our shared culture as we speak. We live inside of each other in that way. So what is me and what is not me? As an interesting aside, because this is a day for interesting asides, the biologist and uh, present-day atheist crusader, Richard Dawkins, if you've heard of him, he called these mental ghosts memes. And he explicitly talked about our mind as being a host container for sort of viral cultural ideas. And the philosopher Daniel Dennett has expanded on that idea quite a bit. So today we talk about things going viral on the internet, or we, we refer to internet fads like grumpy cat as being memes. Um, we got that language from philosopher Richard Dawkins, who will live on uh, through this meme idea in us as a ghost inside billions of humans who use this word and concept and have no idea where it ever came from. Okay, so that's one idea, millions of selves, millions of ghosts. Let's go in a different direction. Let's suppose your real self is the interplay between your physical body, including your brains, which has unique and specific capabilities, right? There's unique and specific things that we can do. So it's the interplay between your physical body and all of those millions and billions of ghosts of culture that live inside of you. DNA plus development plus culture. That's your real self. 
and it determines your human potential in this world, what you can and can't do in any given interaction. What you identify with as yourself when you think of me is not your real self, I'm going to suggest. It's a fictional character that you've created to explain yourself to yourself and other people. Think of it this way. Your brain has evolved over the millennia to be very good at predicting what other animals are going to do by making stories to explain their behavior. This is an important thing for humans to be able to do. It's how we survive. By telling stories to understand what's happening inside of other creatures, what's motivating them so we can know what they're going to do. On a very crude, simple level, it might be something like that bear is running away because it's afraid of fire. It's a story about why that bear is doing what it's doing. But of course, humans are very complex social animals and these complex social networks. So we tell complex stories to explain our behavior. He started that business because he wants his dad's approval. Everyone knows that's true. And there's nothing to suggest that our brain has special knowledge about our own capabilities. There's not really any way it could because so much of our potential develops sort of accidentally after we're born through our environment, parenting, you know, disease, health, nutrition, education, even maybe the bacteria in our stomach, all of these things shape who we are after we're born. So when it comes to our real human potential, we're like black boxes to ourselves. We're mysterious to ourselves. So we face ourselves exactly the same way we face other people as something in the world that we're trying to understand, using our brain that's evolved to tell stories. Now, I have some information about myself that you don't have, because I can observe myself thinking and feeling, and you can't. But otherwise, I form an idea of myself the same way I form an idea of yourself, by observing, acting in the world, thinking, feeling, doing, choosing, judging, and I make up a story to explain what I just observed. And I call that story myself. And maybe it's pretty close to true, and maybe it's not, right? We all know people whose conception of their self is pretty far off the mark. Even when their motivations seem pretty transparent to the rest of us, they clearly don't have any idea why they're doing what they're doing. And we've probably had the experience of watching ourselves do something and then thinking, oh my God, why did I just do that? Where did that even come from? And we are at a loss to explain. So in this way of looking at things, there is a person uh, such as Jamie Hinson Rieger. But the Jamie Hinson Rieger I think of as myself is a fictional character that I created to explain myself to me and to others, to explain the deeds and misdeeds and triumphs and questionable decisions of the real fellow. And of course, other people are telling stories about this Jamie person. And the kind of story I tell about myself, to me, to other people, is going to be heavily dependent on the culture that I grow up in, and the kinds of stories that I'm taught to tell by my parents, by my tribe, by my peers, by the kinds of stories I hear being told around me, by the kinds of stories that I hear other people telling about me. So you'll tell stories about me to me and maybe I'll believe them. And I'll tell stories about you to you and maybe you'll believe me. And all these stories take on their own weight in the world because stories are all we have to understand each other. But they're still just stories. And so we're co-creating one another in this kind of vast work of collaborative fiction. And so what is me and what is not me is not so simple. Okay, can you stand one last analogy? Mm -hmm. Last analogy, I promise. We used to think of the world as made up of bits of matter. There were like solid little balls that were either here or there. And now we know that matter isn't anything like that. Those solid little balls are mostly empty space with other even tinier things inside of them. And when you get to the smallest scales of the universe, the quantum level, you can't say that things are definitely here or definitely there. That concept doesn't exist at the 
quantum level things are sort of smeared out in space. In the same way, we think of ourselves as being a single indivisible thing, an I, that is in charge of thinking and feeling and deciding. And we think of it as being in a specific place, right? Probably inside our body. This is where I live. But perhaps our self is better thought of as having blurrier boundaries than that, as being smeared out in space and time and in social space. Located in our bodies, yes, but even the boundaries of our bodies may be much more porous than we think, interacting with the living world in a much more subtle way than we know. Located in our thoughts and feelings, but also located in our culture, past and present, which is shaping those thoughts and feelings. <clears throat> Existing on its own terms as a real thing, but also being co-created in our interactions with each other as stories that we tell together. Maybe even existing, in a sense, in other people's thoughts and feelings, in the stories they take with them. Looked at this way, and here's the cash value of all of these musings, the question of independence and interdependence becomes more complex and more simple. We can cherish our individual selves, while yet seeing ourselves in each other's faces and understanding that we are inescapably interdependent, but interdependence isn't something to be feared. It's not bondage or coercion or conformity. It's co-creation. We're co-creating one another. And as we come to understand how we're shaping each other by the stories that we tell, we have a chance to substitute new stories, better stories, stories that are liberating, stories that restore love and dignity to all selves simultaneously. The Buddhist tradition has the concept of the bodhisattva, which is the person who stands on the threshold of enlightenment and turns away, saying, I will not go through to heaven until all people go through to heaven. May we say, as our own religious vision, embracing our interdependence, that we will free ourselves by freeing all selves that we will find our fulfillment when all hearts have been filled, and we will rest in peace and friendship when the whole human family has been restored. May that be the new story that we tell one another. Would you please rise and body your spirit for a closing hymn, number 1008 in your teal hymnal, when our heart is in a holy place. <laughs>